everybody. It's Adam Farkas along with Paul Farkas here. And we're back here again uh, today to talk to you about best practices, right? So we have yep. Cooper Vision's best practices program and a couple of the 2019 best practices winners are with us here today to talk about a topic um, prescribing from the chair. Now, this is a rather controversial topic, right? We don't usually deal in controversial topics here, right? But this is an interesting one because, you know, for most patient encounters, right, you see the patient, you prescribe them medicine, you prescribe them contact lenses, the patient goes out the door, they go to the front desk and they're done. But what about when you prescribe them spectacles, yep. right? This is a different process entirely, right? Now, traditionally, you know, as in your day, you'd hand the patient off, they'd go straight back to the, the optical, to your optician and, you know, who knows what went on back there, right? You just sort exactly. of sent them on their way. Um, but but many docs today assert that that's not the right way to do things, and um, you know you should be doing a more active job from the chair of Absolutely. prescribing. And that's what this is about today. Speaking with two highly successful doctors, who are going to talk to us about that, about ways to make that happen. Right, and we have and two people that are really expert on making it happen. Exactly. So uh, so today with us we have Dr. Jennifer Branning from West Shore Eye Care in Ludington, Michigan. And if you've never been there, that's halfway up the mitten on the shores of Lake Michigan. And fun fact, it is one of the most visited towns by tourists in Michigan. Really? Because they have beautiful beaches and there's lots to do outdoors. So uh, fun fact about Ludington. That's in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> they have winter sports too. Um, but anyway, in 1991, Dr. Branning opened West Shore Eye Care, and it's a full-scope eye care practice. And in fact, she expanded it in 2004. Um, it relocated to a new state-of-the-art facility. You can see it up on your screen right now. I'm showing everyone movies and pictures. Um, that includes high-tech equipment used to detect eye disease and the latest patient education tools, and even a specialty sunglass shop. So she has it all going on there. And she has a special interest in medical eye care, pediatrics, specialty contact lenses, and dry eye. Um, and along with Dr. Branning today, we also have uh, Dr. Rob Shaliga from Spring Hill Eye Care in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Now here's something interesting. So in 2005, he received his Doctor of Optometry from Southern College. As soon as he got out of school, he went and he started this practice in Spring Hill. And to me, it looks like a cold open. And we're gonna ask him about that because yeah, it's such because, a rare uh... thing these days. Fun fact about Spring Hill, besides the, pl the fact that that was the place where Saturn got their start with their factory, the member of the Saturn car, yes. um, Spring Hill in the year 2000 only had 7,000 people, and today it's got over 40,000. Rob will have to tell us how so that happened. So this is a huge growth story, so I think that's probably going to be you know, a very interesting story as well. Um, Spring Hill is a full-scope eye care practice. Again, looking up on the screen right now, you can actually see it's the office and, and all the ins and outs of it. He's got three docks and, critically, an optical. Um, and as you can also see on the screen here, he's become an integral part of the community. I'm showing you some pictures here of stuff that they've done in the community as well. So Jennifer, Rob, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you describe your practice a little bit? Uh, my practice is in a very small town, 8,000 people. It's busy, thriving, and I've really tried very hard to stay abreast of medical education as I've aged. Um, I think that maybe is more unique than not. And we see lots and lots of medical patients, but we also see children and families and, and things like that. Lots of uh, working people, kind of a typical private practice, I would say, but with a heavy medical focus. So, so Rob, can you tell us a little bit about your, your practice in Spring Hill? And, and did I get it correct? Did you actually open cold when you came out of school? <clears throat> that's, that's correct. I opened cold with just my mom and sister as my first two employees who had no background in optometry, just a mom and a sister. Uh, but it started with a family atmosphere, and we try to keep that atmosphere still like family with my employees. I don't have any family working for us now. Uh, so I came out open cold. There were some slow years, but I only worked in my practice. I didn't do part-time filling anywhere else. I wanted to exert all my energy on what would be my own practice, not somebody else's someday. Wow. Yeah, so that's a, a very rare thing, as you know, these days, to be able to open up cold and succeed right. at it. So I guess why don't we launch into the topic that we were, you know, ostensibly going to speak about before is prescribing from the chair. So I guess, Rob, why don't you sort of tell us what that means to you and your sort of process and how you do it? Yeah, so the, I think the first part is having a good kind of communication system. Uh, we use a, a software that has called Blue Note that will, we can preset buttons to ask for an optician to come back to the room. 
And instead of just, you know, when I first opened up, we would have them come back. It was a smaller office. It was a smaller office as far as staff and as far as uh, it was only 1,200 square feet. Now we're in an 8,300 square foot building. Um, we don't want patients wandering around lost or just showing up to the optical aimlessly meandering through the building. So we call the optician back to the room with us. And when it, I feel like when you're prescribing from the exam room instead of selling in the optical. So when you're in that exam room, you're prescribing treatment for different medical issues or conditions, and you're prescribing um, ophthalmic recommendations back there. So it's the key is having the patient, the optician come back. I have a menu that I use um, that I've created. I think I'm on my, I don't know what version now. I'm always tweaking it before we, we print a bunch of these. And I use that for a lot of different things. The front, I have just places for them to like us on social media. So I'm giving, I tell everybody while I'm waiting for the optician to come back, I'm going to give them homework. It's to either leave us a Google review or socialize with us on uh, social media. And then as the patient comes, as the optician comes in, um, we'll talk about lifestyle, uh, what they need in their lifestyle. I'll also have a, a section on there about the refractive error because uh, people hear astigmatism and you might as well tell them they have cancer. So I had just basic definitions that they can take to go home and they, if they think, what did he say I have again? Well, I have it checked off what they have. Um, and then it goes through the different modalities and what we recommend for multiple pairs and uh, premium upgrades. So basically you have the optician there nodding yes to what you're prescribing and, that, and, and the patient's also another, nodding yes. So you have two correct. people agreeing and, and with you. Part of it is, you know, it's a lot of how you posture yourself and face. You're not facing the patient. You're kind of in a group that we're all um, working on this project together. We want to transfer authority to the optician. So I think that's important too. Like they have already built their trust in making the appointment, coming to see me, but now I'm handing them off to an optician who they may not know if it's their first time to the office or if they haven't met this optician before. So my job is also to kind of transfer that authority to say that this optician knows what she's doing. I'm going to prescribe this, but then you can feel sure that she's going to go forward and help you out and finish this process. And to do that, we would give them maybe some, some easy questions. I'm going to say something that they might know the answer to, but instead of me answering, I'm going to let my optician kind of answer that to kind of slowly transfer that authority so they begin to trust them also. Right. And, and so, Jennifer, do you do it in a, a similar way? Very, yeah, very similar. We call the optician to the room. Um, we do it a little bit differently. We send our, I have a scribe, so we send the scribe slash text out and let an optician know that we need somebody and, you know, they send them and then they go on and start the next patient. So the optician will enter the room and much the same as Rob. We usually we use revolution. So under the eyeglass prescription, there's a box and we will make notes in there about what we're prescribing um, lens material. And I usually talk to them about why we prescribe certain materials. And then again, same like Rob, we sort of loop the optician into that, you know, introduce them. A lot of times I'll make a comment about, oh, you know, Jerry's a great frame stylist if somebody's looking for something a little different, things like that that they can relate to and feel confident, like, oh, great, you know, she's going to help me with my frame selection. And then we'll discuss a little bit what the patient lifestyle needs are and run it through all the group <laughs> and kind of come to a consensus together about how we're going to proceed based on what I prescribed and what the patient's needs are and what they're wanting to kind of work on that day. I tend to let them know too that, you know, this is a process. You need multiple pair of glasses. Today, only one pair might be in your budget, but we need to look at what your goals are going forward. And we do a half off second pair. So a lot of patients do take advantage of that and, and go ahead and get like a workspace or something. So very, very, very similar to what Rob does. So one, one question I have, um, if this sounds like a great ballet when the cast of characters start coming in, what happens if the optician is not available? It's still working with another patient. <laughs> well, Rob, well, that's you happened a couple one? times in my office. Yeah, this happened <laughs> yep. a couple times. We're, the, the good thing about the economy right now, the economy is going well, but we have a really uh, low unemployment rate. So we're trying to hire more frame stylists instead of we're having a hard enough time finding opticians. So we're going with frame stylists now. Uh, but right now, my uh, Attack will come back and kind of hear this, and then we have almost a double transfer of our party. <laughs> so that I'll, I'll go over with my tech, and then they'll escort them up to the front or try to hang out with them until 
an optician or frame stylist is available. So it did come up a couple times just even today. So it's funny you should ask that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it does happen occasionally here too. So, and we do the same thing. We do already have the notes in, um, and sometimes what will happen, the optician will come back and say that, that somebody wasn't available quite yet. They, we use a, a queue system um, on an iPad, so they'll put them in the queue, and then the optician you know, they'll, they'll see and they'll, a lot of times they'll pop back and get back there by the time we've actually discussed things a little bit more. And, and in worst case scenario, then the tech slash scribe will take them out and let the optician know uh, what, right. what we talked about. So it's not a perfect system, I'll admit that, but we're working on it. We have multiple opticians, too. We have four opticians, so. Wow. Well. It's interesting because it sounds like from the patient's perspective, what you're doing is you, this is a very collaborative process, right? It's, I don't think it's something that a lot of people are used to, right? You know, usually the orders come down sure. from on high and you do what the doctor says and, and that's that. But it sounds like what you guys are doing is much more collaborative. And I'm wondering if that improves the patient's satisfaction at the end of the day. We haven't directly asked, but I think what happens too, if they come back for troubleshooting, they've already a little bit of relationship there because of that transfer authority they maybe respect with my optician say more <clears throat> than instead of finding that he said she said they know what we went over what i recommended if they didn't follow through with maybe getting that second pair for the computer and they're struggling or they're they're not satisfied with just one progressive to do everything and and my optician was back there when i went over saying you know you need a, a second pair for this or a third pair for that that they can't come back and kind of say well I'm having trouble with this. They can, they know that that optician was there to help them and is on their side and, and can re help them remind them of that. I don't know. I've, I've asked indirectly. Basically, what I'll tell patients a lot of times is, you know, we like to get the optician in here because then we have one discussion about this, the three of us, and it's not a, it's not a situation where maybe myself and the patient have discussed what could be useful for them or what I would prescribe for them. And then, you know, I take them out, and then the optician starts saying, oh, you know, do you want a new frame? And they've already kind of talked about that they don't or they do, you know, or do you like the light adapting lenses? It's, it's more the conversation's already been had. And I think, I don't know about you, but, you know, most of us have to get slightly annoyed when people keep asking us the same question that we, that's already been asked. And it's right. like, ah, nobody's communicating. And I think they like it for that reason, that it's pretty – it's concise. They're involved in the decision making. The doctor's involved in it too. They don't feel like it's a it's an optician trying to sell them something. And so, yeah, for the most part, I think patients do really like it much more than just being sent out there to wander the boards of confusion. Yeah. Right. I think it sets expectations. They're not wandering, wondering, what do I do next? Am I supposed to find somebody up mm -hmm. here? Is this the right person? They know who they are because they're coming to coming back there to to be with us instead of just right. wandering aimlessly. Right. Well, I was going to say, too, I think it's, you know, we've got this whole online presence, <clears> and, you know, I think it also sets the, the image that, I mean, it's not just an image, it's reality. You know, there are different lens types. There are reasons that a person might need a different lens type. You know, you don't want to put somebody who's a plus three in a semi-remless frame if you can help it because their glasses are going to be thick. So if you can have those conversations, I think patients look at you and think, oh, you know, I didn't know that. Or it, it, really, it really puts us in the position of being the prescriber that we are instead of this, oh, I can just go online and take these numbers and order my glasses. They, you know, I don't need any kind of expertise or knowledge. Right. Right. And I think they, the patient's perception is that glasses are all the same. They don't, we have to teach them what the difference is in a premium pair of glasses versus just cheapo online glasses. Right. And, and this is obviously a big issue for a lot of folks these days, right? The internet. And so have you found that, and, you know, I don't know if you have the numbers at your disposal, but I'm curious as to how, you know, what percentage of your patients have actually migrated off to the internet? Or is this a discussion that you have with them right up front about the difference between what goes on online and in the office? Well, on this lens menu I use, I do have a, on the back. I don't know if I have a number or percentage. It's, it's not as high as I think some offices, but um, even on that lens menu, on the back cover of it, I have an infographic I found online about buyer beware, like a closer look at ordering online glasses, mm -hmm. and just the percentages of glasses that are inaccurate or that fail to meet the prescription requirements or safety impact resistance, just to kind of give a little warning, too. Right above it, we have a reason for owning more than one pair, and then that little infograph to kind of say, if they're holding that and they flip it over, they're going to maybe think twice and, and then educate them what the, the odds are 
of something that coming back incorrectly on mine. Uh, how do you avoid the price discussions when you get involved with giving the patients the prescription recommendation and they start bringing up cost? Did you get do you, do you to hand that off to the opticians or do you start dealing with it from the chair? I don't get asked too much about that. A lot of, you know, a good grief. I, I wouldn't be able to start rattling things off. There's so many different costs for different products. If they ask about it, I always let them know. I mean, we're all female here at the moment. And so I always say, hey, you know, we get that. We're a bunch of moms. We have things in every price range. So, you know, you, we have inexpensive. We don't have cheap here. And the opticians can help you work with your budget. We can lay it out. We can show you everything. And, you know, I, a lot of times I'll mention to them if, they, if they're concerned about costs, the most important thing is the part of the glasses they're looking through. So we can help them find a price on a frame that suits their budget, that sort of thing. But I don't, it doesn't come up a lot, really, like, well, how much is all this going to cost? Or, you know, I don't get a lot of pushback, and I think it's, again, it's because it, it comes off more as exactly what it is, which is a medical device, and your doctor's prescribing it. And I think the value then is elevated, and, and they sort of step away from price right. because you take a moment and explain to them why it is they need these things. Yeah, well, what I usually say is I don't, I don't know what anything's priced at. I just own the place. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. I just so you hand it off. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to present sort of one tip to someone who's going to change their workflow and really start trying to prescribe from the chair and they're just getting started with it, what advice would you give? I think what, what I would say is you have to – you have to really know in your heart that, you know, hopefully the reason you're prescribing from the chair is because you want to give the best care possible. And if you were, you know, if the, if the roles were reversed and you were having a, a problem, let's say even like, you know, put yourself in the place of going to your family doctor and, and your family doctor didn't help you with a problem that you were having, didn't address it, didn't talk to you about ways you could solve it. And then you went to another doctor who did, your perception of that new doctor who was able to help you with your problem or at least tell you about some solutions that you could try, and then you, you, know, you decide in the end if you want to try them or not, you're going to have, you know, you're going to feel connected to that doctor like, wow, that's a great doctor. They really had a lot of ideas for me. And I think that's what we need to remember is that we're doctors. People come to us because they have problems they'd like us to help them solve and how they use their eyes. And and really, if we don't help them with that, then we're not doing our job. We're not providing the best quality care that we possibly can. Absolutely. So if you keep that in mind, you can feel comfortable. You're, you're not, you should never sell somebody something they don't need. I don't do that. But you definitely need to let them know what they need to, to be comfortable using their eyes throughout the day and their lifestyles. Kind of picking it back and off of that, one of our models that we always say, and I've repeated this before, is um, – what's best for the patients, best for the practice. So we're, we're not trying to sell. We're not trying to upsell and just try to make more money. I want that patient to hear from us what we believe is the best. I think we've, we've heard all before that they said, what if everything was free? What, how many pairs would people get? Well, you'd, you'd have five or six different pairs for every little task. So we're prescribing what's best for the patients. It's up to them to make the decision whether they want to um, spend the money on it. But I think we've got to let them know. You don't want to find out they went somewhere else and, oh, you never told me about uh, lenses that would do this or what these options were. So I want them to know what's out there and keeping up with the technology. And then just from a process standpoint, I think it's good to have a, you got to have a good communication system, whether it's a light system, a message file, a blue note, some way to get that optician back without it being awkward and you having to leave the room. Uh, one other quick thing we didn't talk about, a, a great reason to prescribe from the chair. When I would go out in the beginning, when I would take the patient out to the, um, optical i would get caught seeing somebody i know and then there goes five to six minutes every time you walk up you see somebody know you stop chat talk not that i don't want to chat with somebody but it would run me behind schedule so it's another reason to kind of keep you on time even though because you're doing this back in the exam room and not walking out there with the patient forgot to mention right. that earlier great, great advice well jennifer rob thanks so much for for helping us out with this today yeah. and uh, we're going to post this up on odr and i'm sure there's going to be a million questions and uh, i'll pass them on to you as soon as we get them Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.